All right, we are live and getting set up. <clears throat> we already have somehow uh, over 40 thumbs up on this video. Let me check to see if we are indeed live on the Into the Impossible podcast network where I am being joined by my good friend and many time guest, and that is Professor Avi Loeb of Harvard University. Avi, you're looking tan, you're looking sharp. Uh, I wanna ask you so many questions, my audience has so many questions, but first of all, how does it feel to get your sea legs back uh, being out on the open ocean? How was that? Well, I enjoyed it. Uh, I used to jog every morning. Uh, the only f surprise was I, I jog at sunrise and suddenly I noticed from my workout app on my watch the time, some days I, I jog slower than usual and some days faster. And then I figured out that it's actually measuring the speed of the platform that I'm running on. Uh, and uh, that's the ship that I was on, uh, fittingly called Silver Star. I think I'm probably the first to recognize that you can't really measure your speed when you're jogging on, on a ship because the GPS system gets full. That's right. Yeah, I, I, I was able to walk across the Atlantic Ocean last week on my way back from Paris and London. Uh, but the only way I could do that was on an airplane. So uh, but we're going to talk about things that travel much, much faster than an airplane. And those are, of course, uh, the fragments from a very interesting and, and mysterious object that you have uh, discovered, identified and are beginning to get samples returned. And I understand uh, FedEx delivered, the meteorite was delivered by gravity, uh, I believe, but the, uh, but the samples were delivered by you, uh, by FedEx. So show our uh, viewership, please, Avi, if you would, what you have in your hand, the most precious metals on earth, perhaps. Well, um, I, I decided to share the materials with three laboratories, mainly at Harvard University, uh, we have a laboratory with the best instruments in the world, um, uh, but also with UC Berkeley and the Brooker Corporation in Germany that has some X-ray fluorescence analyzers that nobody else has. And uh, when I shipped the materials to Germany, I had to declare what is inside the box. And I said, sand. And then I had to declare the commercial value of it. And I said, no commercial value. It has enormous scientific value of course yeah um and uh, you know it took uh, millions or maybe even billions of years for this material to arrive to earth by the way it was not a matter of gravity it just bumped into the earth as a result of its trajectory which uh, crossed the path of the earth and it came actually from behind the earth it was moving at 45 kilometers per second uh and it came uh, just as the earth was orbiting the sun uh, from behind the earth. Mm. If it were to collide with the earth head on, if the earth, for example, if you were to reverse the motion of the earth, it would have collided with earth at 90 kilometers per second, very fast. And outside the solar system, it was moving at 60 kilometers per second, which is faster than 95% of all stars in the vicinity of the sun. So here is an object that made its way in interstellar space faster the 95% of the stars in the vicinity of the sun. Now, that material is very precious. Um, I have some material which is very precious, too. Uh, this is a fragment of a stellar solar system meteorite, uh, which was found in Argentina. And you can enter to win it if you click this link or in the show notes. I have it. BrianKeen.com slash mail. And if you're a member of the audience that has a .edu mailing address, you will get this guaranteed. So the rest of you, non-edu. And that's because, Avi, I, I want to see myself as an educator, right? So I want to uh, get access to young minds while they're fertile and they can uh, do the most good. And we have the most uh, free energy to, to use their powers to benefit the earth. And I think a lot of what you're trying to do with this and your upcoming book, which you've uh, graciously provided me uh, with uh, an advanced copy of uh, called Interstellar, uh, that is uh, as part of your mission too, education. Yeah. So, Well, actually, I wrote 36 uh, diary reports from the expedition, and they were read by millions of people over um, the couple of weeks that I was uh, in the Pacific Ocean. They were translated to Spanish. I received a large number of emails from people who said that uh, it improved their understanding of how science is done because often what they hear about are in press conferences where scientists 
lecture to the public the final results. And that's very different from the process of doing science where you uh, are confronted with partial data, you don't know what to make of it, and by assembling more data, you get to the bottom of it. Just to give you an example, we had a sled that was scooping the ocean floor. One uh, day it came back in one of the runs covered in white paint. It looked like a Jackson Pollock painting. And uh, I thought, well, maybe it bumped into a can of paint that one, a sailor dropped from a ship. But then I took my finger, took a sample of it, put it in a vial, and we studied the composition, the chemical composition of this quote-unquote paint ended up being biological. And mm -hmm. then we Googled it and found that there is indeed uh, this kind of uh, gooey stuff that you can bump into at the bottom of the ocean. So here is an example. You first think about a conjecture. It turns out to be wrong based on data. That's the way science is done. And people really appreciated that. There was even a person from Denmark that wrote to me that he had a stroke four, four weeks ago. And as a result of reading my reports, he developed a, a desire for, for a living. You know, like uh, he got a new sense of why life is worth living and I, that was very moving to me that science can can provide people with a meaning as long as you are honest and straightforward about the scientific process you're not pretending that you know everything in advance and people connect to that people connect to the uncertainty whereas scientists very often remove the uncertainty they want to just talk about things that are finalized in a final format and we all know that that's not the way science is made. That's well, not the way the sausage is made. You know, to, to, to be polite and uh, but uh, respectfully disagree, oftentimes, and you pointed this out to me many times, they don't talk about things that they're certain about. They talk about things they speculate about as if they are certain about it. So I, I can't tell you, I was just had the opportunity and the huge honor of speaking at the Royal Institution, the longest ever ongoing lecture series started by Michael Faraday, as you know, back in the eighteen uh, mid-1800s. And, uh, and there, most of the questions were about wormholes and black holes, and I don't know why people are so obsessed with holes in the physics community, but string theory and inflation and all, all these things that you have worked on, by the way. But, um, but to say that we speak about things and it's all nice and neat, sometimes that's true. I think we teach our students. When I teach a lab class, I'm teaching an experiment that won the Nobel Prize you know, in 1963, you know, something like the Davidson-Germer experiment, you know, some some prepackaged canned experiment. I know it's going to work. But oftentimes what you hear about in the media from your colleagues in uh, in theoretical physics, mainly Avi, I have to say, not you, but but man, many of your colleagues, and we know who they are, we won't name them, but they speak about pure speculation with the certainty of fact. So no, yeah. no need to respond so here, to that. But here is, uh, here is my frustration, which touches on yours uh, a week before I went on the expedition, which is pretty much an experimental endeavor. We, are, we were just trying to figure out the materials that made up this unusual meteor that we mentioned that was discovered by US government sensors back on January 8th, 2014. So almost a decade later, we are looking, searching for materials uh, from that meteor. And my colleague, a colleague of mine came forward and said, uh, look, many of us, uh, think that you will not find anything, that it's a waste of money, a waste of time, and why do it? And I said, I'm not asking you to do anything. Uh, you know, I'm doing the heavy lifting. I'm going there. Yeah. And you can just sit back and relax. And if I don't... Oh, hold on a second. Oh. ...money from your dark matter research. Mm -hmm. In fact, the money that funded this expedition was a donation by a person who would not give it to science otherwise. And so it's a win-win situation. I don't understand the negativity about collecting evidence, which is pretty much the scientific method. And why would a community of scientists or some scientists object to collecting evidence or have a bad feeling about it? After all, that's what science is about. It's not about speculating about extra dimensions or not finding supersymmetry after investing $10 billion in the Large Hadron Collider. That's not new knowledge. New knowledge comes with collecting evidence for whatever you're seeking. Mm. Now, your new book, uh, which we'll get to in just a bit, is concerned with extraterrestrial life, not necessarily just extraterrestrial technology. I say just, but I, I don't mean that negatively. Okay, so here is an anecdote related to that. When I was jogging one day, we had a filming crew of a documentary, and they uh, filmed me with uh, from a drone that was looking at the ship from a distance. And then at the end, the director came to me and said, it looks like you are running. 
are you running away from something or are you running towards something? Wow. And I said, both. <laughs> I'm running away from some of my colleagues and I'm running towards a higher intelligence in interstellar space. <laughs> so we'll talk about life in just a bit, because I think I've come up with some notions. They may be uh, speculative, but um, some ways that we can use kind of the reverse of what's happening here, where um, where an impact has occurred on the Earth from a uh, interstellar trajectory at 99.99% confident, 99.59s. Um, whereas I'm kind of interested in the reverse. Uh, in other words, if a meteorite, interstellar or not, hits the Earth, blasts up uh, some of the uh, some of the surface and hits it in a region of the Earth's surface, this is populated by uh, that same bacterial sludge that you found, or whatever it was, or a stromatolite, or perhaps it hits uh, you know uh, you know some some high rise building, and it blasts into space some genetic material, right? So that should be floating around our solar system. I have a fragment, which I'll give you when you come to visit me, as you've promised, and I've promised to visit you too. Uh, but I have a fragment of Mars, which costs, you know, many, many, you won't get a fragment of Mars if you join my mailing list, but, but it costs a lot of money. Um, not as much as your expedition, but it costs a lot. And that means that there are particles of the Earth on Mars, correct? So oh, what, yeah, definitely. What can we there say? Are, about and, 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 and of course, there are many um, objects that come from interstellar space, but it's only one in a thousand of the rocks or the objects that come from the solar system that, um, you know, that may have originated from interstellar space. So most of the, the vast majority of all the impacts on Earth are uh, building blocks of planets uh, like the Earth that uh, are floating out there like Lego pieces. And that's the one you held in your hand. Right. The difference is that those that come from interstellar space may be quite different. And I should say this particular meteor, we know from the analysis of the fireball data that the government uh, provided that uh, it had the uh, sustained uh, stress far greater than all other space rocks that were cataloged by NASA over the past decade, 272 of them. So irrespective about what it's made of, uh, arguing about the, the details, the point is that it had material strength above all the space rocks that we often see from the solar system. And that raised an interesting question. You know, it, it, maybe it's made of some artificial alloy uh, and maybe it was moving very fast just because it had the benefit of pro artificial propulsion. And so of, of course, if we imagine Voyager, that's a, a mission that we send to interstellar space in a billion years from now, uh, it could collide with an exoplanet and burn up in the atmosphere as a meteor. And uh, of course, uh, that would be an unusual meteor of a higher material strength than natural rocks and also could move faster than uh, most of the interstellar objects. I guess my question is uh, kind of the inverse of that. Is it possible that such a deadly meteorite hitting the Earth, blasting off our surface, as the regolith I have from um, from Mars demonstrates, could it carry some remnants of DNA or even life? Is that possible? Oh, sure. This is called panspermia. Now, in terms of um, you know how long can life survive in space, uh, there are estimates in the literature. It's highly uncertain. Uh, most estimates extend the lifespan to maybe 10 million years, not more than that, because the material is exposed to cosmic rays and without uh, any nutrients or uh, liquid water, it may be difficult, it may disintegrate. Uh, and so if it's only 10 million years, you know, uh, traversing the Milky Way galaxy at speeds of tens of kilometers per second require, you know, uh, half a billion years. And so if we're talking about a journey uh, that lasted for uh, half a billion years, any living organism would not survive that long, uh, sure. at least based on uh, of the type that we are familiar with. Uh, it will just disintegrate. So, But on the other hand, if it's, uh, for example, equipped with artificial intelligence, if it has some machinery that was technologically produced, you can imagine that lasting for much longer than a living uh, organism. Oh, yeah. And of course, that is a completely different matter. Yeah. I'm actually asking, you know, whether or not the non-observation of life in our solar system, so the non-observation of life so far on Mars, is that not possible in sort of a, a Drake equation fashion or maybe just a Bayesian estimation? Can we limit the probability of the existence of life outside of our solar system? And the, the fact is that Mars had liquid water on it, we believe. 
that it had you know potential to support you know a microbe you know airdropped onto Mars two billion years ago could have survived potentially. Um, but can we not say something about the overall global odds? I've never seen this. I've seen the Drake equation. I've seen. No. I mean, what we know is that Mars had, has a lower surface gravity, so it couldn't retain its atmosphere. And a couple of billion years ago, it lost its atmosphere. Now, before that, it had liquid water on the surface. And whether, what forms of life it had, we don't know. And uh, that's part of the mission of the NASA rovers that are being sent. Uh, frankly, I, I mean, uh, personally, I believe that we have a better chance of finding traces of any early life on Mars. Uh, in the caves, in the so-called lava tubes, which are these caves that are underground, protected from cosmic rays, uh, and are not really affected by the extreme temperature variations on the surface uh, after the atmosphere was lost. And I'm particularly interested in going into these caves, the lava tubes, and searching for any wall paintings, because maybe intelligent life developed on Mars twice as fast as yeah. it did on Earth. You know, a factor of two is not a big factor. And of course, today they would not be able to survive. There is no atmosphere, all the liquid water evaporated. But if they existed, we might find some wall paintings. And, uh, uh, and, and moreover, we might find some skeletons in these lava tubes. So that's my personal interest, going with a drone into these lava tubes and examining them. Well, yeah. But uh, mm -hmm. we, we cannot say at the moment. Uh, how to calibrate, you know, we cannot say whether there was uh, life on Mars and how uh, advanced it was uh, until we find any traces of it. Just one thing to keep in mind, even suppose there were cities on the surface of Mars, you might say, oh, we don't see any high rise. Well, the point is that any square kilometer of Mars was bombarded by 20 Hiroshima atomic bomb uh, explosions associated, triggered by uh, asteroid impacts. I, I calculated that in a couple of billion years, you basically get 20 atomic explosions per square kilometer and any high rise would be demolished as a result of that. So not to speak about, you know, yeah. any living uh, creatures um, and uh, obviously without an atmosphere or liquid water, they would have a hard time surviving. Yeah. Well, uh, reportedly inside one of those lava tubes on Mars, the scientists discovered four words etched on the walls of the tube. Do you know what they were, Avi? It was. It said, please like and subscribe. So if everybody is out there and you're interested, uh, first of all, I put up Avi's Medium site on the screen. You can go over there, avi-loeb.medium.com. And of course, you can win a meteorite if you go to uh, briankeating.com slash mail. And uh, I first want to start off with some images. So I have an image here. I always like to joke about, um, you know, it's it's uh, it's a very interesting image. I'll just pop on the screen. You won't be able to see it, but it's Meteor Crater, Arizona. Have you ever been there, Avi? Uh, no, I've seen images of it. So if you remember the images, there's this huge, uh, you know, one you know, plus kilometer crater. Uh, and then I always joke, you know, it's so cool that it struck right next to the gift shop. And uh, of course, you know, they built the gift shop later. But but my question for you is, you know, when you look at these objects, um, you know, when you find this object, you should go through the calculations that led you to conclude or in the government to, to agree with this calculation that this was interstellar. But then that you found in Papua New Guinea around the most likely trajectory impact zone, you actually found these spheroids. Is it a just so story? Is it just like this gift shop appearing next to the meteor crater in Arizona? And if so, if not, right. why? Why so let me that? let me explain. First of all, from the crater, you only infer the kinetic energy, the energy carried by the object that impacted the Earth. And that doesn't te tell you separately the mass of the object and the speed that it came at. It tells you the product of the mass times the speed squared. And uh, that's all that uh, uh, you can learn from the size and the shape of the, meet of the uh, crater. So um, when examining uh, impacts on Earth, we can't really tell where these impactors came from. We can't say whether it's solar system origin or interstellar origin outside the solar system. What was special about the meteor uh, from 2014 is that the US government satellites and other sensors detected it when it exploded in the atmosphere and could measure its speed. And they measured the speed of uh, 45 kilometers per second in some direction. And we went back in time and realized that it was not bound to the sun. It was moving faster than the escape speed from the sun. And moreover, it was moving very fast. 
even outside the solar system. So um, we uh, put that in a paper and um, the paper was not published because the referees argued, well, uh, we don't know the uncertainties in the government data. And obviously the government doesn't want adversaries to be aware of the sensors that it's using. So it didn't reveal uh, the uncertainties. And it took them three years to end up confirming, as you said, at the 99.999% confidence that indeed the error budget is extremely small, which is what I expected because they are responsible. Their day job is national security. They have to figure out if a ballistic missile is heading towards Washington, D.C. So um, they have very precise data. They put their reputation on the line. But I should say on the day that we came back, there was a paper published in the Astrophysical Journal by two astronomers who, who argued that um, they are trying to fit the government data with their model for stony and iron meteorites, and they cannot do that. And therefore, their conclusion was the data must be wrong. The speed that was measured must be a factor of a few smaller. Now, the way I was brought up is if your model doesn't fit the data, then you revise the model. But instead, what they say quite arrogantly, I should say, is the data must be wrong because our models for solar system rocks do not fit it. Well, I said that long ago. I said the material strength of this object was different than solar system rocks. That's why the models didn't fit it. And uh, just think about the rotation curve of the Milky Way galaxy. You might argue, oh, the rotation curve of the Milky Way galaxy cannot be fit with uh, assuming uh, ordinary matter that we find in the solar system. And therefore, the data must be wrong. Well, no, cosmologists all over the world for by now it's 90 years are worried about what this matter might be. They call it dark matter. That's a main area of research with billions of dollars dedicated to finding what the dark matter is. But if we were to use the same logic, we would say we don't see this matter in the solar system as of now, and therefore the data must be wrong. And, you know, that kind of logic perhaps is adequate for traditional fields that focused on space rocks. But intellectually that's not suitable for exploring the universe beyond the system the solar system because we know that 83 percent of the matter in the universe is of a substance that we don't find in the solar system and moreover we launched probes uh, out of the solar system so why not allow for the possibility that this object may be a voyager from an exoplanet if you were to take this object in the spherules, um, how do you say it? Spheral, spheroidal? Spheroids. So let me explain. These are just the molten droplets from the surface of the object that were melted when it was exposed to the extreme heat from the fireball. Yeah. And the, uh, the fireball released a few percent of the Hiroshima atomic bomb energy. So I'm going to show on the screen from your medium piece, I'm going to show an image of some of the, uh, the images that you sent me. <clears throat> and uh, including some of the microscopy and so forth. Let me first show the boat and show you on the boat with a magnet. So you can't see it, but my audience sees it, and it's from your from your uh, Medium uh, website. So let me put that up on the screen now. So it's a series of boats. It looks like it has a gantry that you guys lifted stuff on and off of. Talk about the magnetic sled. Get into the details. Nerd out with us, please. What is this black sled? What what does it do? Yeah. How could it possibly contaminate what you saw? Are there are there systematics right. involved? Please please explain. Right. So uh, we decided. I mean, the ocean is uh, uh, has a depth of uh, two kilometers. And think about it. We are trying to find droplets that are a fraction of a millimeter across a region that is 10 kilometers in size. That's the, the region over which the sphero, the, any droplets were spread from the explosion. Uh, and um, uh, that sounds like an impossible task, but the idea was uh, to use a method that was tried before and basically a use a magnetic sled, a sled that is full of magnets on both sides, neodymium magnets, uh, and uh, we dragged the sled with uh, a cable that was attached to the ship, uh, to a winch. And uh, at first, in the first two days, we had difficulties keeping the sled on the floor, on the ocean floor, because there was a, a force, the tension of the, of the cable was mm -hmm. lifting it and the opposing gravity. And we figured that the, the, we had an exceptional team of engineers and people that are the best in the world for ocean expeditions. And uh, they figured the method of basically going with the current and keeping the sled on the ocean floor. So that was in the first uh, couple of days. And then we started collecting materials. 
And basically what we will do is lift the sled. You can see it in the middle panel here, mm -hmm. lift it um, from a two kilometer depth. By the way, the cable went five kilometers because the sled was dragged far away from the ship. Right. Uh, and, um, uh, and so we would bring it back up uh, after usually eight hours uh, when we were going over a 10 kilometer line. And so we were basically scanning in each run a line uh, whose length is 10 kilometers, but the width is one meter, the width of the sled. The sled had a weight of about 200 kilograms, and we added some uh, lead uh, at, at, at the front of the sled uh, just to keep it on the floor. Uh, and so uh, we started collecting materials, and uh, the, the most common, the most abundant material that was magnetic, uh, that we had to scrape from the magnets, uh, was uh, volcanic ash. It was black powder. And the, what, the way we would approach it is once we put the sled on the deck, we would uh, remove this material um, from, from the magnets and put it in vials or in a bucket and then uh, dry it up from the water uh, that was used. Uh, we would use actually later on a vacuum cleaner to suck all the particles that were on the magnets. Uh, that was a very effective method actually mm -hmm. and uh, then we would dry them up and uh, use a mesh with a size that is a quarter of a millimeter to separate the to, to basically filter out all the tiny particles associated with the volcanic ash and then we were left with t particles that are bigger than a quarter of a millimeter and at that point you know we didn't see anything unusual by eye and i wrote an essay one of my uh, 36 um, diary reports it was after the uh, the sixth day i said where are the spherules spherules are these droplets that melt from the surface of meteors as a result of the extreme heat uh, that the surface is exposed to and mm -hmm. the, we expected them to be there and we didn't see them at first by eye but then <laughs> we started looking in the seventh day through a, t a microscope and amazingly enough, uh, the geologist on the team ran down the stairs and called me and said, Avi, we found a spherule. And I went up the stairs and saw it on the digital display of the microscope. And I immediately hugged the person who found it, uh, Ryan Weed, because I knew from my experience in the kitchen, I wash the dishes every day. I knew that if I see an ant in the kitchen, there should be many more ants out there. So after seeing the first spheroid, surely enough, within hours, we, find we found many more. And altogether, about uh, 50 of them in the samples that we collected over 26 runs. Wow. And uh, there is more material, actually, that we haven't had a chance to analyze. For example, this material that I'm showing here, that was uh, collected just a few hours before we left. And so we didn't have a chance to analyze it. So we have a team of people here at Harvard. And you can see here the images. Um, these spherules look spherical. Uh, and they have these beautiful colors of gold, uh, blue, uh, brown, and black. And my daughter, as soon as she saw it, she said, could I have one on a necklace? And I said, well, these are half a millimeter in size. It's very difficult to thread them. And um, so what we are doing is looking at them through an electron microscope. And we, in fact, we did that on the first day we came back. We landed at San Francisco airport and I went immediately with a group of uh, team members to UC Berkeley, where they have some uh, electron microscopes and mass spectrometers. And uh, we looked at the images and the, amazingly in one of the spherules that was found along the meteor path, I should say most of the spherules that we found were along the expected meteor path that we localized by using seismometer data from uh, Manus Island in uh, Papua New Guinea. We could tell the distance of the explosion from that seismometer based on the time delay. And that gave us the most likely path to within a kilometer. And we found most of the spherules next to it and very few spherules far away, like tens of kilometers away. So that is one indication that these spherules are related to the meteor and are not background. Because when we went to very distant lines, uh, we didn't find spherules like that, okay? And these ones are mostly iron. And so this paper that came out saying the government data is wrong uh, when we came back, 
also concluded that it's most, most likely not iron that this meteor is made of. And guess what? They made this statement in a published paper on the day that we came back with materials, spherules from this meteor that show us that most of it is iron. And, um, and that was based on a, an X-ray fluorescence analyzer that mm -hmm. we had on the ship, which basically shines X-rays that penetrate a, hundred, a tenth of a millimeter into the surface of these spherules and uh, excites the electrons in the whatever atoms this surface is made of. And you can learn about the composition from that. Uh, you can tell which atoms are there from the spectral lines, the fingerprints, the spectral fingerprints that these atoms have. And so that allowed us a preliminary test of the composition that indicated mostly iron in contradiction to this paper. <laughs> and uh, moreover, the fact that we found these ferals next to where the government said uh, they, the meteor exploded uh, confirms that the government, you know, I, I, I sleep uh, better at night. I know that the government has good sensors. Now, would the meteorite have uh, detonated in airbursts like uh, most most you know, munitions would be de detonated or nuclear weapons would be detonated? Would it be, have been an airburst event? Yeah, so there was a fireball which uh, was noticed uh, by satellites and by uh, ground-based uh, sensors, and that's what the U.S. government used to infer uh, the properties of this meteor. And there was also a blast wave generated as a result of the explosion. That, as, as I said, we we found the data from the seismometer in Papua New Guinea that we used to infer the distance. And so, it, as an explosion, it was just like any other explosion in the atmosphere. And by the way, there is an atomic uh, explosion, uh, energy equivalent explosion, just like an atomic bomb, every year by a rock uh, the size of a meter uh, or two, mm -hmm. the size of a person roughly, that comes from the solar system colliding with Earth every year. Every year we have an atomic explosion in our atmosphere, mm -hmm. but it's usually at very high elevation. 30 to 40 kilometers so we don't notice any damage but every now and then there is a one that gets closer to uh, sites where humans uh, reside and you hear about it in the news and by the way this is the reason i noticed this meteor uh, historically uh, i was interviewed about uh, a meteor that um, exploded above the bering sea uh, back in december 20, 2018 so in january the middle of january 2019 a month later after the holidays uh there was a radio station in uh, new york city that wanted to speak with me about that meteor and i didn't know much about uh, meteor so i went online and i found this catalog that nasa compiled of 273 uh, meteors and i asked my student uh, undergraduate student amir siraj to check whether the highest the fastest meteors in that catalog could have originated from outside the solar system just because I was intrigued by Oumuamua uh, that was discovered a couple of years earlier. And so he looked into it and immediately we found this meteor uh, that we call now IM1 for Interstellar Meteor 1. And it was a complete coincidence. It, I didn't plan it. I just noticed this catalog and we looked into it. And then uh, by now, this is the site that we visited and found spherules from. When you were to look at, uh, say, an object that you can purchase, uh, say, online, a meteorite, you can cut them open and you see these very, very famous patterns, uh, which uh, their technical name is called Widman Staten Patterns. Uh, they're basically found in all metal, iron, nickel objects. So this would be indicative of a natural formation. I mean, this basically comes from the very same meteorite you'll get if you join my mailing list, um, and you're one of the lucky winners. Let me shrink that so we can see each other. Um, so if we were to cut this in half and uh, treat it with some acids and so forth, you'd see this. Are these spherules expected to display the wind and statin pat patterns as well if they are naturally occurring? In other words, if they're not technological in origin? Well, for the first question we're asking is, uh, uh, is the material uh, different from solar system materials? Okay, and we can answer that either based on uh, the composition of elements within the spherules uh, or radioactive isotopes. Because, for example, in the UC Berkeley analysis of the mass spectrometer, we already found uranium and lead. And as you know, uh, uranium comes in two isotopes, 235 and 238. 235 decays into lead 107, whereas 238 
decays into lead 106. And by measuring the relative abundance of these different isotopes, you can infer the age of your sample. Uh, so because the lifetime is different for the different isotopes of uranium, the 235 lives for 0.71 years, the uh, giga years, billions of years. Yeah. And the 238 li um, has a half-life of uh, 4.5 billion years, roughly the age of the solar system. And so that's a very good uh, kind of clock that uh, can be used to infer the duration of the journey. And when I checked the uh, two spherules that were on the path of the meteor, it looked as if their age estimate is larger than the solar system. But that's something we can do much better with uh, the analysis of more spherules. As we find radioactive isotopes in them, we can date them. We can compare the relative abundances of isotopes to those found in the solar system. Because the solar system was uh, you know, originated from a common cloud of gas that was enriched with very specific isotope ratios, very narrowly confined isotopes, for example, of chromium or, um, or uh, iron. And uh, by studying the spherules that we have, we can uh, differentiate between them and solar system material. But beyond that, if we demonstrate an inter... First of all, if we demonstrate an interstellar origin just based on composition, I should say this is the first time that humans put their hands on materials that originated from a big object that entered the solar system. That would resolve once and for all the doubts that are being raised about the interstellar origin, irrespective of what you think about the government's ability to measure velocities. If we find that the composition indicates uh, materials that originated outside the solar system, that's it, okay? And that would be a historic discovery because it's the first time a big object exploded and we found the materials to be outside from outside the solar system, okay? and. Uh, of course, at that point, there is a second question. C uh, could it be that it was an artificial object, that it was manufactured by a technological civilization? Just imagine droplets melting off semiconductors or an electric circuit. They would have abundances of rare elements that uh, would be very different than the abundances you find in nature. Okay, So in principle, just from the uh, composition, you can say something about the technological origin, but that's an indirect assessment and a much better approach is to find a big piece of this object lying on the ocean floor. And you can think of these spherules as rose petals uh, that romantically direct you to your partner, which is the big piece left over from the meteor. So we know where to look, and that would be the target of a future expedition uh, where we will use instead of a sled with magnets, you know, th that, that kind of sled cannot really pick up uh, anything big. Uh, we will use um, uh, an imager using sonar to uh, look at objects at the bottom of the ocean in the area that we suspect uh, the meteor may have landed. And, and if we find it, of course, we could tell if it's a rock or a technological gadget, because a technological gadget would, could have a label saying made on planet Y. It could also have buttons on it. And I asked students in my class at Harvard in the last uh, class of the semester, uh, of the spring semester, I asked them, if we find a gadget and it has buttons on it, should we press a button? And uh, half of the class said, no way, don't do that because <laughs> we are worried about what may happen. And uh, the other half of the class said, oh, we are very curious. Why don't you press a button? We want to see what will happen. And uh, then one of the students asked me, what would you do, Professor Loeb? And I said, I would bring it to a laboratory and examine it before engaging with it. Yeah, or bring it to a rival university's department chair and have, uh, <laughs> have her open it up. Um, OK, so we have a lot of questions from uh, folks online. And you have a limited time because you're going to Australia virtually in just a bit. But um, but we have a question, a couple questions from David Axe, who's a, a journalist with the Daily Beast. He's just asking, you know, what uh, what's the probability that it's not interstellar? In other words, they're the combination of the spherules having another origin and the, uh, a natural origin and the combination of you not, these spherules being not related to the uh, interstellar meteor. 
Um, and the, the fact that the interstellar meteor may not be truly interstellar. We can't say 100% confidence. So if you add together right. these probability, multiply the probability of it not being right. interstellar. So, yeah. so here is the what we know. Uh, first of all, we know that the velocity information about this meteor indicated that the 99.999%, according to the US Space Command, that it's interstellar, okay? So that's one data point we have. Another one is that we found most of the spheros uh, near the meteor path, the likely path of the meteor, not far away. And I'm talking about a contrast by a factor of 10 or so, because in uh, in one of the lines along the meteor path, which was perfectly aligned with the meteor path, uh, we found 11 spherules. And in uh, background lines that went to control regions, we found at most one to two. So to me, that's an indication that we were, you know, <laughs> bullseye on that uh, particular run that found 11. Uh, but of course, you know, it could be that there was another meteor in that location, who knows, but the chance for that would be quite small. Um, yeah. So rather than um, uh, quantify in terms of probability, all I, you know, I'm, I'm explaining what uh, is the evidence we have, but the best evidence would be if we find isotope ratios or uh, composition in terms of elements that clearly differentiates these spherules from solar system spheres, because there is one, based on the statistics, there should be one interstellar object per thousand of solar system objects of the same size, just based on the fact that interstellar objects were found once per decade. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the uh, catalog of uh, NASA, you know, we found this and another candidate, that's it, over the past 15 years or so. So, um, so with that kind of impact rate and using all the numbers we have, we estimated that one in a thousand is interstellar. And that means that if you find an interstellar composition, in other words, a composition that came from far away, uh, you know, the, I would say at the 99.9%, .9%, that would say it's interstellar because only one in a thousand of meteors should be interstellar and you find it just at the place where this explosion took place and the US government claimed at the 99.999 so I would say it, it would be very certain at that point so I would just wait a few weeks I know that uh, David might be anxious to know the answer quickly but then you know we just need to wait for the evidence that's the work of science and one thing I saw is that many scientists prefer not to wait I mean first of all they told me not to go there <laughs> and even though I you know I was doing the heavy lifting uh, so now they're saying, oh, you found something else. And I say, just, you know, relax, sit back. You know, in a few weeks, we'll know. Why Why are you so happy to make negative statements all the time? Mm -hmm. When you were on last time, you gave one of the great all-time quotes on the Into the Impossible podcast. You said, the sky is not classified. You still stand behind that. But the seafloor yes. is classified. In fact, the Navy here in San Diego classifies wide, wide swaths of it. Um, have you dealt with any governmental officials, either in New Guinea or in the United States, or been contacted by any people that you know dress even better than you do with uh, pens that click like this uh, to make you forget? Have you been no, approached I, I by governments? Got, uh... Because it is a sensitive thing. It involves sonar, multi-channel sensors, multi-messenger processes, and material science and so forth. Have you been contacted by any governments that you can disclose? Well, first, 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 I should say that finding the truth about interstellar space is easier uh, at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, two kilometers deep, than it is... Uh, based on government officials. You know, you, you can't really, I mean, David Grush came up with a story. We don't know, it was just hearsay. We don't have any direct evidence. However, you know, I came back with materials, okay? Uh, so just to show you that it's better to be a scientist than a politician. <laughs> uh, science is better than politics, but- Do you doubt his story, by the way? I mean, are you skeptical of his claims, Grush's claims? Oh, no, I, I'm not skeptical, I'm intrigued. But on the other hand, you know, uh, I cannot just rely on hearsay. The point is, if he were, he was, himself was never exposed to That's right. direct evidence. So yeah, he doesn't claim I don't know to, what right? to make of it. It's just, people may have fooled him and he may be completely sincere. But someone told him stories that are not real. You know, that's possible. Every, anything to do with humans providing the evidence, you know, to me is, uh, can be doubted. Uh, that's why in science we use instruments. We can't write a scientific paper based on what people say. 
Okay, that's right. so that's different from the legal system where you can put a person in jail based on what people say. And we know that a lot of people are put for the wrong reason in jail. Yeah, um, that's why Galileo anyway, said, coming, uh, coming Galileo said, your, yeah, coming back to your question. Yeah, um, I got only encouragement. First of all, the Department of Defense wrote this letter to NASA, which came to my defense. Okay, so here is a government organization helping the scientific process of uh, supporting you know, uh, a scientist who is interpreting their data. And I found that to be very generous on, on their side. They, they put their reputation on the line. They, it was not part of their day job. Uh, anything to do with interstellar space has nothing to do with national security, right? And they're paid to deal with national security. So they took time away from their day job and did mm -hmm. that, wrote a letter. That doesn't convince astronomers. They still can write a paper a few weeks ago saying they don't believe the US government, but I'm saying the US government did an effort here to help us. Mm -hmm. uh, and I listened to them. And the other thing I should say is, you know, uh, I received some emails, uh, including from the Pentagon during the expedition saying, great work, keep up with the science. And, mm -hmm. you know, on the one hand, I don't know if government has any uh, information that is being hidden from us. I don't believe conspiracy theories. Uh, but at the same time, I would say, you know, that doing science the way it should be done by collecting evidence is the way to expand our knowledge of interstellar space. And frankly, I don't care about whatever is manufactured by humans. And so if it says made in China, that's something that Washington DC should deal with. I don't care about it. It's as uninteresting to me as a bird. Okay. If I find it in my uh, telescopes, cameras that we built at Harvard University. So I'm just trying to follow what the science is all about, collecting evidence rather than having a prejudice, rather than tweeting about things that you believe in, because social media doesn't, will not reveal the truth. It's the scientific exploration through instruments, collecting data. And that's the way, you know, uh, cosmology is done. That's where I came from. Black hole research is done. That's where I came from. So I thought it would be a piece of cake. You know, if there is data that seems anomalous in this case, just like in the case of dark matter, if, you know, so I see Oumuamua not being a comet, I would say it's not a comet. So what could it be? And then instead of uh, the approach taken in, in the cosmology community, where people talk about the nature of dark matter in many different ways, when I suggested something different from space rocks, uh, there was a huge pushback. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand that, quite frankly. Um, so speaking of the government and so forth, there was a question from one of my uh, listeners. I'm just calling up the article that he posted for me by Douglas Dean Johnson, that non-Earth, a Senate intelligence bill gives holders of non-Earth origin or exotic UAP material six months to make it available to AARO. Um, all right. What what is this impact, if any, on the spherules that you found? Well, this is really interesting. Uh, the first question is, does government have uh, such materials? And, you know, are they related to a meteorite that they, mm -hmm. they had access to? And But it doesn't say whether these meteorites are natural or technological in origin. So, um, and six months is a long period, you know, so... What I can say is we already have access to a meteorite that most likely came from outside the solar system. We'll find out what it was made of and we will let everyone know. I mean, so that's the beauty of science that it deals with open data, open uh, knowledge. And I'm not hiding anything. What you see is what you get. Once we figure out the composition, uh, we will let it out. And by the way, I spread it among three laboratories with people that are that do not have any agenda that are completely neutral to mm -hmm. what the data might bring. Uh, these are experts in studying meteorites and, you know, uh, they will just tell me what the, their instruments find. Okay. So it has nothing to do with people. And yet I see a lot of people saying, Oh, we think it's that we think it, that's not the way science is done. It's by using instruments. We have the spheres in our hands. Put them under the microscope, the electron microscope that can resolve scales of hundreds of atoms, you know. Yeah. And um, we are able to do mass spectroscopy that will give us trace elements down to a level of uh, uh, 10, 10 parts in a billion or something, you know. So we will do good science out of this. And that's the way science is done. We have the instruments. We're doing it right now. Just 
sit back and relax okay so all these people that want to say something negative don't say it wait <laughs> until we come out with the results and then we can debate what they mean it's reminiscent of what the namesake of the galileo project this guy galileo galilei said he said measure what is measurable and make measurable what is not already so um, on the issue of what I would say provenance, perhaps, um, on the in the chat room is my good friend, uh, Kurt Jaimungal. Uh, he and I did a wonderful uh, interview with uh, Jim Semivan, who's a uh, former CIA operative and a, uh, a very famous, you know, musician, Tom DeLonge of Blink-182. And you know, he was, in my mind, credited with, you know, bringing a lot of the modern interest in UAP, UFO type phenomena to the public's attention appearing on the front page of the New York Times not too long ago. He's got his own To the Stars Academy and so forth. And uh, But while he was on the call, and I hope to do a part two with him uh, and and hopefully my good friend Kurt and, and other people that are in this uh, field, because so much has happened in just two years since we did that interview, less than two years. But on that call, he said he has alien artifacts, <laughs> uh, including alien biological specimens, uh, except he could not a vouch for the provenance. He said the provenance had interruptions in it. In other words, he had not, he couldn't verify the chain of command going back to the origin of where this object came from. And he admitted it. It wasn't like, you know, some gotcha moment. He, he himself admitted it. And I'd love to follow up with him more on that. But um, what about to those who say, well, you can't Avi vouch for the provenance of these spherules either. You, you got them, you scraped them up. Maybe, you know, somebody malicious, you know, planted them or how, what steps is, uh, be, are being taken to ensure the provenance that there's no molestation of this stuff, that there's no, um, that no, nothing gets interjected, interspersed, some, some oil right. from a, a technician's hand. What steps to ensure the, uh, the integrity of these data points are being taken? That was very important for me. And uh, uh, a few weeks before the expedition, I sent a memo to all team members uh, that uh, nobody touches the sample uh, without my permission, okay? And uh, I just wanted to maintain the integrity of the sample. And uh, when we, uh, I was on all runs, you know, I was monitoring how we scraped the magnets and it was all done straight to a bucket that was immediately brought up to the analysis room where it was dried up, the material was dried up and filtered. And uh, we made sure that the, there is no contamination whatsoever. And I should say that it's very difficult to imitate uh, material from, uh, you know, another uh, planetary system or we shall see what we find in this composition. But you need to plant a rare uh, elements at some very particular uh, abundance pattern. And we can easily tell if that was, uh, you know, played with. And also to make those, just to give you an example, one of the spherules that we looked at through an electron microscope at UC Berkeley, it had those ridges on the surface that are dendrites, basically. And from the spacing of these ridges, and by the way, this is half a millimeter in size, but we could see them very clearly. Um, and uh, from the spacings, you can tell the temperature that was that this uh, material was exposed to uh, during the explosion. And uh, we can compare that temperature to what uh, we infer based on the properties of this meteor. There are lots mm -hmm. of ingredients, that are lots of details that you can find in the spherules about in terms of their morphology, uh, what they are made of. Uh, for example, we by looking inside one of them, we found spheres inside spheres, just like Russian dolls. And uh, uh, the reason is that at first, these small, smallest droplets, the size of a few hundred atoms, condensed, solidified, but then they were engulfed with uh, molten iron and that glued them together. And then a bigger drop came over and engulfed it. So to make such a thing in the laboratory, even if you are very ambitious, I think I would, you know, it, it would be a very difficult task to make it because you need huge temperatures that are provided by atomic explosions, for example. But we can tell the difference between the droplets from an atomic explosion based on the radioactive elements. And mm -hmm. uh, anyway, there is there are lots of details and we will put them in a scientific paper to be submitted to peer review and the way science is done, hopefully within a month. And right. so everyone will have access to that. And, um, you know, that that's the way you do science. Mm -hmm. I should say it gives them um, the one thing I wanted to bring up is uh, this type of research uh, gives inspiration to artists because just a couple of days ago, there was a sculptor from Spain who decided 
to uh, build a, a, a giant sculpture inspired by my research. And also behind me, there is a letter that I received from Alan Bergman, who wrote the windmill of your mind and won uh, four Oscars, three Grammys uh, to, um, I mean, he, uh, uh, all possible uh, prizes, uh, awards. And he is uh, writing a song for a play that uh, is almost completed about my research with the hope that it will be presented on Broadway. And, uh, you know, there is, a, of course, there is also the documentary being made, but I should say the public at large is very inspired by, first of all, the fact that this research resonates with their interest. So science can be exciting. That's my point. Science can be exciting, doesn't need to be boring. Uh, and it can also resonate with what people want to know. And um, just, you know, uh, the fact that I'm funded without um, uh, using the conventional paths of uh, applying to federal grants, uh, just from individuals that uh, come to the porch of my home and provide the funding. Mm -hmm. you know, that is an illustration of how this subject appeals to the public. Yeah, definitely. Okay, I know you don't have that much time left, so let's do some qu quick lightning round questions. Uh, reminder, you can always ask me questions on Instagram or Twitter at Dr. Brian Keating, Dr. Brian Keating. Uh, in, here in YouTube, subscribers, uh, I'll try to get to you first. Um, so I have one from Andy Mode. I'll put that on the screen. For one such me interstellar meteorite to hit us, there must be huge amounts of similar objects passing through the solar system. Can you speculate right. on that, Avi? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, uh, this object, as I mentioned, came from behind us. The Earth was orbiting the sun. And based on the rate of impacts, we can infer that there should be a million such objects at any given time. If you look now at a snapshot, a million objects, half a meter in size, from interstellar space within the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. Now, we can't see them. They are, they are dark to our telescopes because they don't reflect enough sunlight. We could see Oumuamua because it was 200 times bigger. Okay, So it had an area that is 200 square times bigger than this uh, meteor. And uh, 200 square is a big number. It's, uh, it's four times 10 to the... The, the four, uh, you know, and, and uh, that allows telescopes on Earth to, to see the sunlight reflected of an object the size of a football field. But uh, our telescopes cannot detect the amount of sunlight reflected of a half a meter sized object. And we have a million of those right now within the orbit of the Earth around the sun. And so, of course, we can design observing strategies, uh, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, you know, going into space. Uh, that would be a very fertile uh, uh, field of research in the future. But what we found with this expedition is that um, instead of using telescopes to learn about what lies outside the solar system, we can use microscopes. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a completely new window into the universe. So, yeah. And then along those lines, I'm going to echo a question uh, posed by Echoes in Lo-Fi. Um, he or she is asking, will Galileo Project be studying meteor fragments and exotic metals found in the Unita Basin? And will you be collaborating with the landowners other than Skinwalker? Uh, let me rephrase that question. Let me ask the question. Uh, a low cost way to, you know, see, uh, uh, you know, without going to the expedition on, on the ocean again, I, I couldn't go with you. I get seasick on a, on a paddleboard, but um, I'm sorry, I can't go with you. But, um, but just test every terrestrial meteorite, stony, uh, metal, test every single object that you can get a fragment of. I'll, se I'll sell you one of these, you know, for a Harvard t-shirt maybe. But um, can we just go into the uh, yeah. you know, storehouse at so Arizona State is, University? Here is the interesting point that once we understand what makes something interstellar in terms of composition, okay, based on the analysis of this meteor, then we can go back to reservoirs of meteors that we had on Earth, okay, and check if any among them could have been interstellar in origin based on our understanding of this one. And that would be a very interesting thing to do because in the past, when people collected meteors, they may have classified a small fraction of them as a rare class of space rocks that belong to Earth, to the solar system, you know, and, um, uh, and perhaps as th that small fraction represents the small fraction of interstellar objects that impacted the Earth over the billions of years that the Earth existed. So, um, yeah, I think that is a valid, a very good question that would allow us perhaps to identify uh, some small subclass of the meteor meteorites that we have on Earth uh, to, as interstellar. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'll take some questions from my audience on YouTube uh, on the chat comment section. Avi, can you, and, and please feel free to answer briefly if you need to, Avi. Can you please okay. speculate on why entities visiting the Earth seem to be so interested in us? Military, nukes, cattle, <laughs> and that's from Anonymous oh. Bevy. So um, in this case of the meteor, I would argue that if it's a technological gadget, it's not uh, functional. You know, it's just like Voyager would be in a billion years colliding with an exoplanet. So it's just space trash. Think of it as space trash, just like the plastics in the ocean. You know, our civilization is producing plastics. And by 2050, there will be more mass in plastics in the oceans than the mass in fish. Yeah. So don't eat fish from That's the ocean I... after 2050 because it may contain a lot of plastic. That's why Montgomery Burns invented the OmniNet on The Simpsons many years ago. Okay, Avi, this comes from Paolo de Sousa. If the analysis of the spherules and other retrieved materials comes back as natural materials are inconclusive, will the next expedition to the site of IM-1 be conducted anyway? No, um, I think it will happen if we find it to be interstellar. Uh, otherwise, there is another candidate uh, between Portugal and the uh, Azores um, mm. that uh, we identified, and it's another potential target. Uh, the US government did not confirm that one. Uh, so we have something to do no matter what, uh, but uh, let's see first what we find from the composition. Yeah. Okay. Then if it does come back uh, as interesting or you know possibly um, uh, valid to, to consider as an interstellar object and, and so forth. Uh, when this is from awaiting aliens 762, so 764, so don't think it's a completely uh, impartial person. But uh, when they, they're asking, when you go back next year to look for large objects, what will be the methods and tools and technology that you would add yeah. to the expedition? Would you use the same ship? Yeah. What, what kind of tools would you, uh, is on your dream yacht besides the president of Harvard, you know, providing one for you? <laughs> No, I mean, we thought uh, about that already and thought that of using a sonar that uh, would have a frequency of um, uh, high frequency so that we can identify, um, you know, if it's 30 kilohertz, identify rocks uh, uh, and separate them from anything different. Um, uh, and then um, we could also have um, an ROV, uh, uh, some uh, imaging device that is hovering over the surface and surveying the region of interest, we have to decide based on the amount of money that we will have. Uh, obviously, if we find this object to be interstellar based on composition, we will have the money, no doubt, uh, irrespective of how ambitious we are, because a lot of people would like to know the answer. Uh, so it all hangs on what we might find. And as I said, I gave it to laboratories that I trust, you know, whatever they deliver back. I mean, it's not up to me. Uh, and uh, whatever they bring back uh, will be reported in the scientific paper. And we will know hopefully within a month. Okay. This comes from Mike9678. What are your opinions on UAVs or UAPs, etc.? Are they from another planet? What's your most likely, you know, Bayesian sense, Avi? What, what, if right. you had a you know, guess, you put a gun to your head, uh, what, what do you think right. they are? Well, so Sean Kirkpatrick, uh, in his latest testimony to the NASA co study committee, he said that you know, only a few percent of these unidentified anomalous phenomena are truly uh, anomalous. That uh, a lot of them are presumably uh, balloons. <laughs> you know, we saw the Chinese spy balloon, but there are many more balloons. Uh, or drones or airplanes, they can figure them out. And, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, of course, for him, it's very important to make this assessment because of national security interest. That's why Congress funds Aero, the All Anomaly Domain Resolution Office. But for me as a scientist, I'm exactly interested in the opposite, uh, in the tiny fraction of objects that cannot be explained and could be of extraterrestrial origin. And even if it's one out of a thousand, that would be of great interest. So in the Galileo project, we already have a functioning observatory and we are planning to make more of them. And in fact, just before I joined you, we had a conversation, a discussion within uh, the research team of the Galileo project about how to treat anomalies. And my view is if we don't have good enough data, we will simply report uh, objects that we that do not uh, 
it cannot be explained as a known type of objects of like birds or balloons or so we will just say that they are outliers they are anomalous we can't figure them out but if we have good enough data for example we have triangulation we have information about the temperature of the object the distance the speed at which it was moving if we have a lot of information then we could potentially make a more uh, significant statement that it cannot be a human made uh, technological gadget and you know in that case if it looks like a technological gadget and it doesn't seem to be human uh, then it would suggest an extraterrestrial origin so all i would say is we need to develop the capabilities to figure this out uh, using instruments and yeah. um, you know there people talk often about the nimitz incident uh, where people saw um, some, some um, you know people saw uh, objects moving really fast and I say, if you go on a highway and you see a black car in front of you, and then you see a black car behind you, you might say, wow, this car really, you know, was moving really fast, but uh, it may not be the same car unless you have the license plate. You can't tell. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Avi, it's coming to the end of the time that you have before your next uh, appearance. Um, and I want to just say that you will be appearing on the podcast next month for the release of this book, which I am devouring as we speak in all formats that your publicity team has provided to me. Interstellar, the search for extraterrestrial life and our future in the stars. Um, and the last question I have um, from the audience has to do with um, the role that the New Guinea government is playing. Are you involved with them? Are you part, are they participating in any way? Do they have provenance? Do they have uh, access to the samples? Yeah. What's their role? So we established a collaboration with uh, the University of Technology in Papua New Guinea. And in fact, uh, we have the head of uh, a department there. Uh, we are planning for him to visit us uh, very soon and be part of the analysis and we'll share some materials. And so we have uh, a collaboration uh, with people over there, because what we have, I mean, we collected 35 milligrams of these spheros. This is really tiny amount of materials, but it's to be shared with the scientific community at large, including with scientists in Papua New Guinea, which we hope to get involved with our analysis. So, um, and, uh, you know, so altogether we see it as a collaborative project to advance scientific knowledge. It has no commercial value whatsoever. It was a tiny amount of materials that we retrieved. And it just, belongs just tell them it's to... laced with fentanyl. Just tell them it's laced with fentanyl. You cannot give it to Well, it, it belongs to someone outside the solar system, you know, and uh, let's figure out who that is. Yeah. That what what if they the... say uh, you have to return it to, to where, it, where it came from, Avi? What are you going to do then? Does Harvard have the budget for that? Oh, actually, my dream, if you ask me what, I mean, Elon Musk says that he dreams of dying on Mars. My dream is to board a spaceship that will make it to another planet and appear as a meteor in the sky of that planet and then a scientist over there would pick a, a, a particle of dust from my body from the ash produced by the explosion out of my body and i would feel very honored to be studied by a scientist on an exoplanet that would be my greatest honor so wow. um, just to summarize i look forward to speaking with you again in a month and hopefully then we will know more about the composition of this meteor. So stay tuned and I'll be back with more details. All right, Avi, I'm going to take us out with Shooting Star by Bad Company. Wonderful song. Avi, thank you so much. Best of luck and have a wonderful summer, Avi. I'll talk to you next month. Thank you. Looking forward to it.